Welcome to the podcast, An Intelligent Look at Terrorism. I'm your host, Phil Gursky, President and CEO of Borealis Threat and Risk Consulting in Ottawa, Canada. For those who have been listening to my podcast over the past couple of weeks, you've detected a theme, and that theme was looking at different brands of extremism or terrorism that is tied to a specific religion. We've looked at Hindu extremism, Buddhist extremism, etc., and these podcasts were actually a bit of a flavor, if you will, for my forthcoming book, When Religion Kills, be released by Lynn Reiner and Associates this December. For today's podcast, I want to go in a completely different direction. For the past few weeks, I've been asking you to submit your own questions, your own comments, your own thoughts on terrorism, and we're going to entitle this particular podcast, the Ask Phil podcast. I've had a great response in terms of the questions that have been forwarded to me, so thank you very, very much for doing that. In fact, I had far too many questions than I have time to answer in this particular podcast, so I've decided to devote a number of recordings over the next couple of months to try to address all of your questions that you were so gracious in sending me. For today's podcast, I want to focus on three or four questions that I found really interesting certainly touched on some elements that I've talked about a lot in the podcast over the past little while. But as I say, I promise that all of those who took the time to put in questions or comments, I will address those in at a future date. The first question came to me on the Resilience Post, which is the webpage which also hosts my podcasts and my blogs. And the statement or question reads as follows. Label it what it is. However, the press media need to stop giving it so much airtime. Deal with it, report it, and get on with life. The more attention it gets, the more it'll act out. What I think that the author of this question, or probably better stated statement, is trying to get at is that we are perhaps giving far too much attention to terrorism in our reporting, meaning newspapers, websites, TV, radio shows, etc., And it certainly is true that terrorism stories do feature highly when we do look at the news, either in the traditional formats that I'm more used to, TV and radio, or more increasingly online or on on your cell phones. It's particularly true in the wake of just what happened on the weekend in the United States with the attacks in El Paso, Texas and Dayton, Ohio. The El Paso attack is looking more and more like a terrorist attack, or at least a hate crime whereas the attack in Dayton is a little more nebulous in terms of what the motivation was. There's no question, however, that there's been ample widespread coverage of both events, with a lot of people reporting the facts, even more people weighing in on what it means, what can we do about it, how can we prevent future attacks, etc., etc. The bottom line here is that news organizations, or people who post blogs, such as myself, or podcasts, or information online, are in one sense simply reporting what is happening. There's no question that there are terrorist attacks in a lot of places on any given day, so it certainly is newsworthy. And I'm wondering if we, we, if we would rather have the opposite situation where these particular types of attacks were being ignored or being underreported. I certainly understand the person who sent in the question's frustration that in some ways by giving these attacks or foiled attacks or attempted attacks a lot of media coverage, we're simply feeding the terrorist beast. One thing we do know is that terrorists want attention. As U.S. terrorism scholar and very highly regarded analyst from my perspective, Brian Jenkins, said decades ago, well before the current focus on terrorism, we'll get back to that in a second, he noted that terrorism is theater, meaning that it's performance. Terrorists do something, we report it, we become anxious, we become apprehensive, we take certain certain measures, some of which may be good, some of which may be not so good. And as a result, the terrorists have achieved their goal, and that's to get at the forefront of our minds. I don't think we have a choice, though. I don't think that ignoring terrorist attacks is an option. One interesting thing that some countries and governments have chosen to do, and this happened for most recently, in, to the best of my knowledge, during the uh, terrorist attacks in Christchurch, New Zealand in March of this year, Governments have taken to not naming the attacker. They won't give the person any attention. They won't say their name. They won't give them the 
notoriety, perhaps, that they will. I've always found this a very curious position as well, because again, who the attacker is, what his or her background is, how they became radicalized to violence in the first place, this indeed is actually newsworthy. And so I have often ask myself, what's the danger of naming the person? Could they in fact inspire others to act? That certainly is a reality. And in fact, I just read a news story online that said that the Americans, American officials, are worried about people trying to emulate what happened in El Paso, Texas uh, on the weekend. We did see that Christchurch in some ways was inspired by somebody here in my country in Canada, Alexandre Bussonet, who attacked a mosque in Quebec City in 2017, and also by Norwegian terrorist Anders Breivik in 2011. So there's no question that terrorists do feed on each other, but I think it's an open question whether or not news coverage is the most important angle for that or the most important source of information for that. I would argue, given what I do know about the use of social media by terrorists and terrorist groups, that this information is put out there on a regular basis. There are many, many websites and forums that people can go to to seek information on terrorist attacks, those who carry them out, the messaging, in some cases the manifestos. So I'm not so certain that not giving terrorists the attention they deserve is going to actually help matters. I don't see this as a way to prevent terrorist attacks from happening. I could be wrong, and I, as I said, I understand what the questioner is getting getting at when he posts this online, but I do think that it's hard to say whether or not suppressing information will either act as a deterrent or, in actual fact, may, in the opposite direction, force people or lead people to carry out more terrorist attacks in order to get that attention. So I think this is an interesting question. I don't think it's going, going away anytime soon. But thanks again to Security Dog 56 for posting the question on the Resilience Post. The next question is somewhat related to that, and it was also very, very interesting. This was posted by Anonymous, and it was in response to my podcast on Jewish extremism, and it goes as follows. Hi, Phil. My question to you is, is this. Why do we feel the need to categorize terrorists by race, religion, etc.? Why don't we deal with these people the same way we deal with other criminals? Name them, shame them, charge them, etc. The categorization aspect seems highly politicized. I think you can see why this question is linked very much to the first one. And it goes with how we, as a society, address terrorism. How do we report it? How do we cover it? How do we deal with it? And my answer is going to, not surprisingly, be very, very, very similar to the one to the answer to the first question, in that we label or categorize terrorism for what it is for two very, very important reasons. First and foremost, most countries have adopted, put in place laws that treat terrorism differently from other forms of crime. I will cite, for example, the Canadian Criminal Code, because as a Canadian, that's what I know best. But there's a whole section of the Criminal Code that talks about terrorism as a serious act of violence which is carried out or planned for reasons of religious, political, or ideological motivation. In other words, if there's a serious act of violence that's carried out for reasons other than those or for unknown reasons, it's simply not terrorism. Now we can argue, and, it will, and maybe I'll get to this in a, in a future podcast, whether or not we should treat terrorist acts more harshly in terms of sentencing legislation than we should other forms of, of violence, including murder. That's a separate issue. So our criminal codes ask us to categorize things as what they as they are. Secondly, I would argue that as analysts, as those interested in talking about terrorism, it's really important to differentiate terrorism from other forms of violence. If you want to understand what terrorism is all about with the ultimate goal of putting in place measures to either prevent it from happening or, in a perfect world, preventing those from actually radicalizing to violence in the first place, which in many cases leads to terrorism, you have to know what you're talking about. And if you were to eschew or ignore things like categorization, so, you know, what is, you're looking at the motivation, is it religious? If it's religious, what religion is it? If it's a particular religion, what sect, what what aberration, what non-normative or non-mainstream version of the religion is getting at this? What kind of materials are people consuming, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. We need to do that to gain the fullest possible understanding of a particular act of terrorism. That's what the science of analysis demands. You don't 
ignore information that's important because you're afraid of making it worse or you're afraid of embellishing it or you're afraid of giving terrorists more credibility or more attention than they deserve. You're simply trying to analyze a phenomenon. In this way, I would argue that terrorism analysis is like any other scientific discipline, either social science or pure science. You gather data, you look at the data, you, in some cases, not maybe not necessarily in terrorism, I would argue, you would run the data through, through some kind of a paradigm where you have, a, or you have an existing hypothesis as to what's happening, and you look and see if your data, in fact, supports the hypothesis or does not. Bottom line is, is that you've got to measure, categorize, quantify what you've collected to the best possible ability, and then come up with, in some cases, an overarching theory as to what's driving terrorism or a subset of terrorism, etc. So in this case, I would again disagree with the person who posed the question in, in saying that both our criminal codes demand that we treat terrorism differently. And that's, that's, an, op that's an open debate. And I love to, I said, we'll have that debate at some point. More importantly is that from an analytical perspective, and I did work as an analyst in the Canadian intelligence community for more than three decades, uh, to be true to my profession, it is really important to call things for what they are. Again, I'll bring in Brian Jenkins that you know, terrorism is theater, ter terrorism wants, terrorism, terrorists want attention. And as he famously said in another paper he wrote years ago, that terrorists want more people watching rather than more people dead, which is true because the people who are watching become afraid and then they do things that terrorists want us to do, cutting back on liberties, adopting legislation, pulling out troops, et cetera, et cetera. But, but again, I think at the end of the day, we need to, we need to describe terrorism for what it is as opposed to calling it something generic uh, that it ha in, in the sense that it shares some commonalities with general criminality and, ge and general violence. So from my perspective, going forward, I'm not going to change the way that I do things. I'm going to be as honest as I can, as accurate as I can as an analyst in trying to describe and account for the data that I see. I won't always be right. Uh, I certainly have made mistakes in my career as an analyst, and I make mistakes in my, my post ceases my post-intelligence career, but I'm going to do the best job I possibly can given the knowledge that I have and given the support I have from other analysts out there. So no, going forward, I'm going to categorize terrorism for what it is. Another question that came in is as follows. Has the United Nations agreed yet on a single definition of what terrorism is? I think it has, but I think the bigger question is why haven't we collectively as a species come up with a sense as to what terrorism is. So I, I just read a little bit of what the Canadian Criminal Code says. I'm guessing the U.S. Criminal Code is slightly different. The U.K. Criminal Code is, again, a bit off or a bit, you know, um, not off, off is the wrong word, uh, a, a, a bit distinct. Australia, New Zealand, European Union, etc., etc. It seems like each jurisdiction takes a look at terrorism from a, its own angle and sometimes to suit its own purposes. In my forthcoming book, When Religion Kills, I go into some detail as to what different countries have looked at in terms of what terrorism is and what it isn't. I don't think we're going to get to a point where we can all agree. There are national distinctions, there are subnational distinctions, there are linguistic distinctions, and I just think it'd be rather difficult for us as humans. We haven't done a great job of world governance, despite the efforts of some very, very good people. So I'm, I'm not sure we're going to get to any kind of commonality in terms of definition. The last question I'll deal with in this podcast is as follows. Why do we feel that Islamists want to kill as many non-believers as possible? This is a really good question. And it, to answer it, you have to gain a fuller understanding of what drives Islamist extremism. And I'm not talking about you know, why Al-Qaeda does what it does or why Islamic State what does what it does. Those are interesting questions in the, amongst themselves. And you'll find when you look at terrorism and more narrowly Islamist extremism terrorism, you'll find that you'll have actual regional, sub-regional, national, sub-national differences in the sense of why groups say why they're doing what they're doing, what their justifications are, how they, they paint their actions as legitimate for reasons X, Y, or Z. But underlying all these Islamist extremist groups, there are some commonalities, despite the regional differences. And one of the important differences uh, actually has to do with religion, has to do with faith, which again was the topic of my forthcoming book in December. Islamist extremists have a very narrow, non-normative, non-moderate, 
non-mainstream interpretation of Islam in the so far as they believe a that Islam is the only legitimate re religion on earth in fact they would say that they i.e. the terrorists are the only true instantiation or the only true reflection of Islam in that other and other Muslims in fact are not true Muslims this is why you see that most victims of terrorism of Islamist extremist attacks are in fact other Muslims they're not Christians they're not Jews they're not non-believers I'll get back to that in a second but they actually are other other Muslims because they would say these other Muslims are not practicing the faith correctly and when they don't kowtow when they don't bow down to the demands of the terrorists they're often killed you see this a lot with uh, attacks on Shia Muslims in Iraq in, in other countries in Nigeria now we see crackdowns on Shias so even within Islam itself there are certain subsets if I can use that phrase or term of Muslims that in fact are seen as legitimate victims by the jihadis the Sufis for example are often targeted by Islamist extremists who by the way are all Sunni Shia extremism is a different beast altogether the Sunni extremists see this see the Sufis as non-Muslims they don't like their practices uh, they don't like the use of music the use of dance in, in the worship and so they, 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 they label them as targets and they've killed them beyond that what Islamist extremists have done is they've taken the traditional Muslim or Islamic view on certain faiths ie Christianity and Judaism in which in normative Islam Christians Jews and Muslims are all called Ahl Kitab which is Arabic for people of the book this refers to the fact that those three religions all share the same prophetic tradition going back to speaking as a Christian I would say the Old Testament and then the New Testament and if you look at the introduction and, and beginnings of Islam starting in this in the seventh century you see in fact that it is built very closely and very and very heavily and very crucially on this common prophetic tradition that started with Judaism and went through Christianity and so in traditional Islamic societies Christians and Jews were allowed to practice now in some societies they had to pay a tax called the Jiza in order to have that privilege but they were seen as legitimate believers they were seen as a faithful people beyond that it gets a little more problematic so for some people the other faiths are all lumped in, in what are called the Kufar which means non-believers in Arabic the word kafir and these people had no rights sometimes they were enslaved sometimes they were kicked out of territories but they certainly didn't have the same rights that Christians and Jews did when it comes to Islamist terrorists ie jihadis all this stuff is thrown out the window they see Christians and Jews anyone as illegitimate and worthy of killing and I think one of the greatest and, and saddest examples of this in recent history was when Islamic State would target the Yazidis who have a very ancient religion that they practice for thousands of years and they saw them as non-believers worthy of, of dying and so what the Islamic State terrorists did was they tended to kill kill all the men and and the older boys and they enslaved the women and children they raped the women and they and they took the, the children as their own because they saw the Yazidis as the Kufar as the non-believers who did not deserve to live did not deserve to live freely did not deserve to retain their freedom to worship as they have for thousands of years as I, as I alluded to earlier so the Islamist extremists really do see us all as the enemy this is why they're trying to kill as many people as possible they have enveloped and wrapped themselves in their very very bizarre twisted grotesque version of Islam and they've used that version of Islam to justify what they're doing in fact they've gone so far as to say that killing non-believers killing kufar which involves or includes most of us on the planet is not so much something that should be done but must be done it's a divine duty it's something which they call farth ain which is an individual obligation on all true muslims to get rid of the enemies of islam with the long-term goal of creating a planet in which only one version of islam i.e their aberrant version of islam is going to dominate this is why they target all of us this is why they target non-believers and in fact getting back to the to the question posed by uh, my, my listener uh, they do want to kill as many as possible thankfully they do not succeed most terrorist attacks fail and even Islamic State which created a so-called caliphate in Iraq after 2014 a it didn't end very it didn't last very long it ended 
a low Islamic state is still a terrorist group to worry about. I had an earlier podcast on that. But they did seek to carve out this geographic territory, which they thought would eventually spread to the region and then beyond and then worldwide. And therefore, they would rule by the rules that they are putting in place and the laws that they would enact, i.e. The, the, the laws based on their very bizarre understanding of Islam. So, and, and going forward, the terrorist groups, which are Islamist in nature, the jihadi groups, will continue to try to kill as many non-believers as possible. That's their ethos. That's the way that they do things. Wow, that was, that was only four questions, and already we're getting to the end of the podcast. I, again, I do want to thank those who have sent in questions, and, and please feel free to ask more questions in the future. Please feel free to leave your comments, and I'll, and I'll remind you where to do that uh, in a minute. But I really do want to thank those of, the, of you who have taken the time to listen to the podcast, who sent me your feedback, who have engaged in, in, with me with questions, with comments, with debate. I love talking about this stuff. Obviously, I'd rather wouldn't be podcasting about it. And I think most importantly, from my perspective, I love to learn. And therefore, if you can point out something that I've missed or that you feel that I've misinterpreted, please don't hesitate to do so. I don't want to be wrong. I know I'm not always right. And I rely on you, the listener, to put me back on the straight and narrow when I when I have strayed from it. So please let me know what you thought about the Ask Phil podcast. Again, this is the first of what I hope to be many podcasts going forward. You can leave comments after the podcast itself, wherever you happen to listen to it, various platforms on which the podcast is hosted. You can reach me on email at borealisrisk at gmail.com. I also can be found on Twitter at Borealis Saves, on LinkedIn, or on Facebook. I'll have a brand new podcast for you in two weeks' time. So I'll talk to you in a fortnight. Until then, stay safe. It may sound absurd, but don't be naive. Even heroes have the right to plead. I may be disturbed, but won't you concede? Even heroes.